Well, thank you all for coming out. And uh, so we're this is on some tips for screenwriters and for for filmmakers. So let's just kind of uh, I guess real briefly kind of go down the line, and kind of talk about some projects that you worked on and who you are. Just that, that way everybody has a name to put to the face. Hi, I'm Michael Cassett for the uh, since there are more of you here. Uh, I won't feel it's too repetitive. Um, written a lot of nonfiction, um, fiction, several novels, uh, short stories, but primarily television, television scripts, probably about 100 of them for 15 or 16 different shows that I've actually been on staff for and a few other freelance things, everything ranging from Twilight Zone, Max Headroom, Erie, Indiana, to, I forgot to mention this earlier because I'm ashamed of it, Beverly Hills 90210. <laughs> the most lucrative year I will ever spend in my life and one I will not repeat. Um, more recently, Dead Zone, and at the moment, a show called Z Nation on Sci Fi Channel. Very cool. Uh, I feel like I shouldn't even be sitting in between these two guys. <laughs> uh, I'm Derek Johnson, um, a writer, director, producer, you know, all that kind of fun stuff. I've written a few uh, feature films, uh, some that have been made, some that haven't been made, some that will be made, some that I made myself, <laughs> and, um, and, and, Currently making a documentary, which some of you heard earlier, um, about the director of Rocky and the Karate Kid. His name's John Avildsen, and uh, we're telling his life story, career, talking about his films, breaking them down, and uh, so that's what I'm doing these days. Yeah, um, Mike and I are kind of on the same era. You know, we go back to dinosaur age. We just found out we we sold the same magazine early on, Mike Shane Mystery Magazine. But I've written a lot of nonfiction. I started with nonfiction, and I moved to my love, which was fiction. I've written about and sold about three or 400 short stories. I've lost count. Um, they, I've done uh, a lot of articles. I've written 45 novels that, that are under my name. And uh, when I was starting out, I did some pen names. And uh, I've written for Batman, the animated series, and Superman, the animated series, both in the 90s. Uh, I just I did Son of Batman, which is a, a longer Batman film that just came out for an, with animation. Um, I've written tons of screenplays that did not get made, but for which I made money to Ridley Scott, John Irvin, uh, good grief, I can't even think, the, the David Lynch, people have optioned stuff of mine for years, thank goodness for them. And uh, I'm working on uh, producing films now. I did uh, uh, Cold in July, I'm one of the producers on, which is based on my novel. And there was Bubba Hotep, which was uh, based on my work, which I did not produce, but at least uh, they did it right. Um, so, you know, and, and there's a lot more stuff than that. Comic books, I wrote for uh, DC, Marvel, Dark Horse, IDW, et cetera, et cetera. You remember when I said I shouldn't be sitting there? <laughs> <laughs> but we're old. <laughs> um, my main task is I'm a moderator. I have written six screenplays, and one has come to have um, been filmed. And so, let's go on down. Uh, I'm Howard Walter. I probably had more movies not made of my stories than anybody <laughs> up here. But... Uh, so far, so far, nothing, right? You know, and and uh, now maybe something. We'll see, right? So, I'm Eric Huber, writer director for Rainbow's End and Flutter, and I just recently signed with ICM. They're packaging my next film right now, uh, Children of the F Children of the Fire, and I'm just trying to keep it going. ICM's good age. Congratulations. I wrote the screenplay for Christmas with the Dead, which is what got me up here, but I'm, I mostly write comic books, and uh, I used to write for the uh, newspaper, mostly, obviously, uh, nonfiction, since they frown if you do fiction with them. <laughs> <laughs> but either way, there's been uh, a little bit of short stories here, some magazines and stuff to let me write a few things, and kind of whoever's willing to pay me to write something, I usually do something for them. So. Um, you know, a little bit of that in this, but I'm also the son of that one, so. Uh, this one right here. Yeah. The, 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 the young one yeah. on the end of We part. favor. <laughs> and uh, I also was not good enough to get any part of the table. <laughs> Maybe next year. <laughs> Well, um, I know that uh, w one thing um, that uh, there's so many folks out there that are making films and writing for screenplays. I, could you talk the difference between writing between short stories, novels, screenplays, plays? What's the different? Uh, how is writing a screenplay different than those other uh, sources of writing? And just whoever would like to start off. It's completely different. I mean, it's. I mean, yes, you've got characters, you've got stories, but in a novel or short story in prose, first of all, you are everything. You are the music, the lighting the location, the star. Um, 
and you can suspend time. You can live within someone's head for an entire story. You can you can suggest. You can do all these things that in in screenwriting words that are basically a blueprint for some group of people to go out and build sets and find locations and get trucks and and act. People have to actually understand what you're saying and then perform it and make it work. It's a it's a different kind of thing. I mean, there you can't live in someone's head for for two hours. Uh, I, I mean, I suppose theoretically you might be able to do a movie like that, but it's it is just uh, the difference. There's a, just a huge difference between drama and and prose to me. Um, they're they're both fun. They both have their satisfactions, but uh, to me they're actually quite different. Go ahead. Uh, I, well, just a little example. I, I wrote a script, uh, you know, which is my baby. And uh, a lot of the people were telling me, the producers and studios and stuff, we love the script, but the genre doesn't really sell right now. Turn it into a novel and come back to us. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm a screenwriter, okay? So I was sitting there, and I got to page one, and that took me nine months. Because it's such a different structure, and I, I just, I, I don't think I can do it right now. Uh, and, and so uh, that just goes to show a script and a novel completely different. Yeah, I, I find screenplays real easy to write for the most part. I can usually do them pretty quickly because I, I just leave out all the hard stuff, which is the novel. But uh, the thing the, about the novel is that the novel, and Mike said it, you can get in people's heads, you can move time, you can have millions of char uh, characters that, you know, I have an army out here, but if you're going to film it, you might not have enough money to I film hire it. That army. Yeah, I got to <laughs> hire that army, so you can't do it. But for me, it. short stories are my favorite form, and I always think of that somebody's quote that a novel is an easy way to write a short story, and I believe that's true because once you start to understand short stories, it's much easier to write a novel. It's still a transition thing but it's the same way with screenplays when I wrote my first screenplay I had never seen one because there weren't all these books with screenplays in them and there weren't you know all every time there's a great movie now they have that screenplay you can buy it right. and, and read it but back then they didn't have that so I said well gee I want to write a screenplay I wonder how this works so I just wrote made it up and made up this idea and I optioned it 11 times and sold it for a whole bunch of money and they never made it but I had never seen a screenplay. And then when I finally saw one, I thought, well, I was close, you know? <laughs> but, but to me, it's, it's because you don't, you don't spend as much time in people's head. You can use kind of inner monologue and things like that, but it doesn't work as well in film. And you can uh, have two people in a book talk for 50, 60 pages if you want to, if you're good at it, if you're good at dialogue. It's still less difficult for a novel, but if you're good at that, you can do it. But in a film, not only can that be boring, even if the conversation is good, if it goes on too long, you don't have that much time. Your thing about comics, too, is, is beat the page count, and with an, uh, a screenplay, it's beat the clock. Because right. you, you're going to have so many minutes. I mean, I, when I looked at uh, films made from, my, from Cold in July, I love that film. But there's a lot of stuff I wish was there, but if it was there, it would be like the original cut, which was two hours and 40 minutes, and they left stuff out then. And the novel's not that thick. No. But because you're dealing with character and you're dealing with dialogue and then sometimes something that, that you can visualize in the novel and you would think, oh, it's a film. All I got to do is just show that. It'll just lay there flat. So it's, it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's a as-you-go thing. But for me, screenplays are the easiest because you get to leave out so much. You get the page going and there's a lot of white space. Yeah. You know. <laughs> the thing I found is... When I'm writing a short story, all the plays I wrote as a playwright that didn't work and <laughs> just laid there were wildly successful in the short story. I you know what that. I mean? Right. I've done that. <laughs> you know, they've done that. I mean, you've gone over the same ground stuff, mm -hmm. and except this time, you just say it worked, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and stuff, and then go on, right? You know, unlike in writing a, a play or anything like that, where you have to actually do it right. and make it work, right? You know, but it's like it's like a it's almost like a shorthand method of, of getting across the same ideas and stuff. Yeah. But it's like, it's totally, it's totally different, two different kinds of writing. And right? you can yeah. cheat, because I took short stories and turned them into plays easier. And, and then I tried to write a play one time, it was terrible, and I turned it into a short story, and it worked. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> right, exactly. I have only ever written screenplays. Which I think are smart like producers. Think are easier to write than people think. They're, they're a lot easier to write than people think. Yeah. Well, uh, being on the end means I get to echo some of the stuff, but uh, it's, 
a big difference from writing a screenplay and everything else is a screenplay is a group project at the end of it. You're, I mean, not just not just in the budget or having to hire a bunch of people, but usually you have that game of telephone where it's uh, I mean, if you're adapting somebody else's stuff and there's a writer before that, then they have the original voice and then they tell the screenplay and a screenplay writer and then the screenplay writer gives it to the director and the director has their interpretation and then it gives to the actors who play it a certain way who have their interpretation and then the editor at the end just changes it how he thinks it should look and by the end of it that first original story could be way different down the line and that's why writers always hate what their movie turned into but when you're writing a novel I mean or a short story or anything else or a comic or something you are the first and last voice on it so you have a little more control of it but it's also you're also responsible for a whole lot more how it turns out but uh, it's just like he said you are you are the star you are everything so that's the biggest difference that I've noticed one thing I'd like to add is uh, it something that's probably definitely different for for you but with with cold in July how you said a lot of things were left out if you write an original screenplay an original not based on say a novel the audience won't miss what they didn't know existed in your draft so Go ahead and cut, cut, cut what you need to do. For, but when you're doing a novel to a to a screenplay, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that can get very frustrating. I love the film, but yeah, and it's a great film. Um, it, it's just you know, don't worry about in an original screenplay what the audience doesn't know that you had in there originally. So. That's that's so true. And that's smart. That's right. You know, you don't think about that. And the other thing to the screenplay, it's almost like the more you can cut, the better it gets. It isn't always the case. You know, I, you know, no absolutes in any of this stuff. But you start you start uh, putting all this stuff, and it's just oh, it just reads beautifully. Then you start having to have people say these things, put it in their mouths, and you go, oh, maybe not so much. Or, you know. Well, when, well yeah. yes, yes, sir. I would say in television, uh, we see this all the time. I mean, usually the first cut of any television episode. I mean, it, say even network and cable is you want a forty-two minute show. Uh, your first. Just the first assembly, or or somewhat edited, is at least forty six or forty seven minutes, and then because you always find things that you thought you needed, all this shoe leather or connective tissue that you thought you needed in the script, you can see it goes from here to here. Everybody gets it, and you cut it. There's a uh, one of the unsung geniuses of television was a guy named uh, Roy Huggins who created oh, Maverick yeah. right. and The Fugitive and Sugar all foot. these things, and and he codified a lot of this. He said it's called peeling the onion. You know, you just Scrape it, scrape it, scrape it down to what it ought to be, and that, that's where you are. Uh, my, my, when, when I first started writing, I wrote a lot of plays initially, and there is, it's all dialogue. When screenplays, it's you show it, you don't say it as much, and that was a yeah. transition to go from there. Exactly, yeah. And you definitely want to see things visually. You don't need to say every di piece of dialogue there. They can they can see something in action. Sometimes though, you have people that are just such brilliant brilliant dia uh, dialogue writers, like. Uh, was it well, uh, the guy that wrote Network? Patty uh, Chayefsky. Chayefsky, yeah. fantastic. Sometimes Tarantino. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, Aaron Sorkin in television. Yeah, there right. you go. Yeah. And so you want to hear these guys. Yeah. If you, but the thing is, is what happens is sometimes when you have really good dialogue, you also have to have really good actors because oh, they yeah. deliver it. They can kill it. We talked about it earlier. Ray Bradbury. We're both like Ray Bradbury's work, but when you take Ray Bradbury's language when he's when he has dialogue, it doesn't play very well because people don't really talk that way. But yet, it's stylized and beautiful on the page. It's right. just like poetry. Right. In fact, what's weird is he wrote lousy poetry and great prose yeah. as poetry. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, what are, what are some tips you give young uh, screenwriters? Because I know there's some folks out there that are writers right now. And what are some of the tips that you've learned through your experience of writing screenplays? We can kind of let's start at the let's start at the other end. Yeah, we, now we, give us a break. Yeah. We'll get our the yeah. <laughs> right. So yeah, when it comes to it, the most important thing is just actually getting through it, and I, that means actually putting words on page because the hardest mm -hmm. part is actually sitting down and getting started. But once you once you find a voice and once you actually start to kind of figure out what it is you want to do, it sometimes will start to tell itself and. I think a lot of people, they over plan and they over plan. I mean, there's been plenty of times where I'm working on a screenplay right now with my dad and there's plenty of times that we've gone back and forth over some detail and then the next day we go, you know, let's just cut this whole scene. Yeah. And we spent all day just going back and forth. And it's still usually some, you know, minute detail, but it was very important at that moment. And then the next day it's like, oh, I guess it wasn't that big a deal. But once you, you can't tell what's important until you get through it. So once you kind of, 
start to really get some work on it, really get your idea, that voice will take over from there. Well, you, you adapted that short story of mine. How was that? I mean, how did that feel to adapt a, 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 what, a few page short story into a full length feature? Well, yeah, that's, and that's a prime example where that particular story was, if you had filmed it as it was, it was a very short little, uh, you know, 15 minute story and it didn't have 90 minutes. And even if you had expanded that where it stayed the original story, it still just wouldn't have done. But it had to have its own voice and had to have its own thing. So once the original concept kind of got on the page, it, it started to breathe life into it. And then by the end of it, if you've read the short story and you see this movie, you're like, well, I didn't see this coming at all because this is a whole new thing. And I do not usually like whenever something gets added to a story like that, but there's just no way that original thing could have been 90 minutes. So yeah. it, uh, it, it started its own life from the original short story that was adapted, but then it found its own voice and it kind of told its way all the way through to the end. So. Okay. I don't know. Eric? Uh, it's tips for filmmakers. Well, if you want to get started, I mean, you just you just have to put time into it, and you have to, uh, you know, I, for me, I like to write three pages a day. If I, for me, if you write three pages a day, you can write a, you know, you can write a, a ninety-page screenplay once a month. You know, it's not that hard. You just have to, you just have to be, you have to. I like I like to set goals, and I like to set realistic goals, and and they're usually daily, and make them to where they're they're consistent. There's something I have to perform each day. You know, with rewards or what, and what have you. But as far as you know, screenplay, once you once you once you execute a screenplay, like proofread it. Um, nobody wants to read your bad grammar, um, and and get your friends over and table read it. Get your friends over and 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 see if the dialogue sounds like something somebody would say. You know, um, and you know, and then and, and 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 work that, workshop that. You know, and then give it to people who are critical. Don't give it to people who are yes men and just tell you what you want to hear. Uh, and listen, listen when people give you feedback. Right. The old, the one I would, the one I would do is like, is show not tell. Right. I mean, they tell you that when you're writing anything, but in screenplays, it's it's exactly right. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> exactly right. Like the ex the example I always use is from Chinatown. When when the co when 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 Faye Dunaway is getting away with the daughter, and in her car, and the cop fires the shot. You hear the you hear the sound of the horn, right? Because you've already seen the scene earlier, where Faye Dunaway leans over and hits the horn on the car, so you know exactly what's happened, and you're behind the car from like a hundred yards off, but you know exactly what's happened in that car when you hear that sound, and like because you've already seen it before, right? You know, stuff like a town was town was excellent in that, right? In foreshadowing mm. stuff oh, all through the thing, right? You know. One of the greatest screenplays ever written. I right, think. exactly. Oh, William Goldman wrote the rest of them. <laughs> right, well, William Goldman wrote the rest of them. He's right, right. One, one tip I have is uh, if you can remove, remove the name of the character and you can still tell who that character is, I think you have good dialogue for that character. And that's that's a hard thing to do uh, all the time. That's a good point. I'm fine, yeah. thanks. Oh, uh, well, you know, the Thank thing, I, what Eric said, I really agree with that. I, I show up. You know, when he was talking about he wrote three pages a day, that's my goal is three to five pages a day. And I tell myself, if I get three to five pages a day, I'm a hero. And I can be a hero every day because I don't have unrealistic goals. I don't set like, I'm going to do 25 pages every day. <laughs> you might do that one day, then the next day you just hate to get up. Right. You know, but I love getting up. I'm, I mean, I'm so excited every morning when my feet hit the floor, I'm ready to go. I don't dread writing. I don't, I love doing it. And so I go in and do my three to five pages. I sometimes, and this is the truth, I work 15 minutes a day and I'm done. But then other times I'll work, I hardly ever work more than three hours because I start getting diminishing returns. So I usually work about, it averages about three hours. You know, and that includes bathroom trips and go get the coffee and, and all that sort of stuff. But for me, if I get three to five pages, I've set a reasonable goal and I'm excited about it because I know I got that goal. And then some days I go in, I have my three to five page goal and I'll get 10 or 15 pages, you know, and that's great. And I proof it as I go. I don't write fast and then fix it later. I don't fix it in post, so to speak. I fix it then. That doesn't mean that when fix I get through. Yes, but, yes, post it. Yes, <laughs> but when I get through with it, then I go back and I'll do another polish on it. But I don't do that sort of thing where I just slam out ideas and you know hope to hell everything comes together because I find that when I come back and I look at it, if I just wrote it like that, I'm depressed 
I mean, it upsets me, and I feel like, oh my God, really, this is much worse than I thought. But if I go through it and do it as I go, it's never what I ever wanted to be. I've never ever achieved what I wanted. And actually, if you ever do, then you're or think you do, then you're probably thinking a little too highly of yourself. But if you go through and you write it and you polish it as you go, by the end of a, a certain time, you've got, like you say, a screenplay. You've got it like in 90 days or certainly two months, counting you know days days off if you took the weekends off, for example, or you, you had to go to a funeral or you were sick a day or whatever. But at least every couple of months, you could have a draft. Now, that comes easier when you've been doing it longer. But I always tell people, they say, what's the most important thing? I think, you know, learn the format, but don't marry yourself to it. Be able to experiment a little bit with it. I know I've done some really odd experimentations with screenplays, and I sold them all. So, you know, I, I don't know whether that's good or bad. But the main thing is show up. And if you show up, at the, and for me what works is the same, just general, the generally the same time every day. I get up in the morning, I take the dog out, I have my coffee, I have my granola bar, I try to figure out who I am. And what's going on? And but then I don't let it do go too far because I still like to be within that dream state to some degree, because I don't challenge everything. And I go in and I start writing. And then as the, I get a little later in that morning, I'll go back and I'll correct my uh, pages and try to get them as tight as I can. And then when I start feeling like I'm getting tired or it's just starting not interesting, I just quit. And if I've got the three to five. I'm done if I don't have any more coming. And I generally try to start while I've still got a little gas in the tank. Because the next morning when I get up, it's all filled up overnight. And I get up and I pick right back up. But if, a lot of people think, I'll just go in and I'll cram this weekend. And, and it just burns you out. Or it does me anyway. I'm not saying that other people can't do it that way. It just doesn't work for me. Uh, I have uh, two tips. Um, about eight years ago, I made two huge mistakes. Um, don't send out the first draft. Just don't. Um, it sucks. It sucks. It sucks. It should be called the crap draft. <laughs> exactly. No matter how much you polish. Exactly. Fun, don't send it out. Draft. And then yeah. the second thing is, is when you have a major studio interested in your script, don't tell them that you want to direct it. Don't tell them you want to direct it. Uh, I made that mistake. So seriously, don't send out the first draft and don't tell a major studio that you want to direct it. It's not going to happen. Um, it, you, you miss out on major opportunities when you, when you have a little bit too much, like you said, think a little highly of yourself. Yeah. And as time goes by, eight years later, yeah, you kind of wish you hadn't done it. <laughs> uh, two things, one of which dovetails uh, with something Joe just said. People get hung up on format. Yeah. I mean, I hear that a lot, and it's formats evolve. Uh, first of all, there are a million examples you can look at, just look them up. But it, to show you how irrelevant it is, Dan Gilroy wrote a movie I recommend to all of you called Nightcrawler. Oh, yeah. This year. Great. The script is basically one sentence. He wrote it almost like a stream of conscious. Now, he directed it. He didn't have to, yeah. and he raised the money, and his, uh, his wife is Renee Russo, so he's somewhat connected to the business. But uh, I've read some of it, and it, it reads, you know what's going on. I mean, that the whole rule is just, can you tell, could, could somebody read this document and understand what you're trying to do, then it's fine. Yeah. So don't worry about whether, well, am I capitalizing too many things in the wrong place? And, you know, do I have enough in my spacing? And are Interior, the margins, exterior. I mean, you worry about, yeah, you worry about that. I mean, at some point, people, and, and for God's sake, I mean, this may be too basic for some of you, but don't put numbers on the scenes. You don't need that unless you're breaking it down for production at some point. So you'll you'll know when it's time to do that. Um, the writing hours thing is, is a... Uh, is a good thing to think about. I mean, chances are most of you are not in the position where you're writing for a living, so I'll go to where, how to, this is the, this is the key. This is what you came here for. The actual <laughs> answer to being a success as a part-time writer is not just scheduling time when you work, it's scheduling time off. Yep. The idea of, because the, the thing, I was a part-time writer for years, and yeah, I just lived with uh, shame and guilt all the time, because well, I should be doing something, I should be doing something, I should be doing something, and finally I hit on this idea of I set regular hours, reasonable hours during the week, and it was literally an hour and a half on Tuesday night, an hour and a half on Thursday night, and then maybe an hour, you know, an hour on Saturday morning. It's a schedule. Morning. A schedule. Mm -hmm. And those were the times I wrote. I sat there and I did my one page of, or, or two pages, but then that meant Monday night, Wednesday night, and especially Friday night, and most of the weekend I was off, and I allowed myself to feel off, and I was fantastically more productive, 
and happier about the whole process yeah, it's, all it's, the way through. It's absolutely, give yourself man. the time off as long as you have a reasonable, workable amount of time on. Yeah, for me, it's five to seven days, but but it doesn't matter as long as every week you're doing something. You know, I, I get people that tell me this. This is the one I hear all the time. Oh, I've always wanted to do it, but I just don't have time. Liar! <laughs> You've got time. You're watching every crappy television show. You're on Facebook. Yeah, you're on Facebook, and you're buying, like, a, a case of beer, and you're, you know, you're hanging out down at the bar, but, I, you know, I just haven't got time to get it done. No, you don't want to do it. You don't want to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I stepped over the line on the bar for Mike, but but anyway, the, the, the thing, yeah, the thing is, is that most people are, are kidding themselves. They like the idea of doing it, but not doing it. And the person that does it like every once in a while, that's not a, that's not a writer. It, I'm not saying that, that it couldn't get done and it might not be good, but it, that's a hobbyist. And anybody out there, says, I'm waiting for inspiration. Oh, go to hell! <laughs> you know, inspiration is you. Your inspiration. It's not something outside of you that comes in for a visit. You know, it, it's something that you actually inspire by showing up every day. And some days when you're writing, you just feel like you're just the least inspired ever. You'll look back at it and you can't tell the difference in the days that you yeah. thought you were really inspired. And sometimes it's best. I wrote some of my best stuff one time. I had the flu and I was really sick, but I was in such a dream state. Everything was just so weird. <laughs> and, and, and when actually when I got through, I, I had really written something very interesting you know so you never know and you can anytime you can you show up if you've you've been doing so you've been working for a couple of months on something and you just you just feel like you're just about to come undone just say you know what i'm just gonna write one sentence and i'm gonna quit today you write that one sentence and you'll go you know i think i can write another one and then before you know it you've done your three to five pages I, at least that works for me most of the time but then i also i'll take periods where i say you know what? i'm gonna take off today and just read I do that every day anyway. If you want to write, be a reader. I don't care if it's a screenwriter or what it is. Watch movies if you're a screenwriter. But I sometimes I'll take off and say, I'm just going to go to the movies. I'm going to take off and read a book because I need that that day. But if you tell yourself that all the time, then that's called goofing off. <laughs> but if you do it every now and then, that's called relaxing. It's called letting, uh, what Mark Twain had a phrase for it, letting the well fill up. That's what I always think too, yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, I think one of the most important things I, I see with some young screenwriters is not having scenes for a reason. Every scene needs to lead to another scene, need, right. needs to be there for a reason. So some of y'all like to speak on that. I would love to have some input about that. Start the other end again, I guess. Or maybe back at this point. Yeah, 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 yeah. uh, not that I actually have anything to say about it, except that, uh, <laughs> actually, yeah, it, there is a, I mean, there's some old television terms, we call them like thrust and recap, you know, where you, you every, as you got toward commercials, you wanted to thrust ahead, so you wanted to give people a little sense of urgency, and there's something to come after the commercial break, and then recap is you tried to give somebody the sense of, well, this is, you know, you got to remind people where they are. If like, you were in the bathroom during that Yeah, moment, yeah, it's like right. you come out, oh, that, yeah, that guy's got a gun on so-and-so because, but I mean, it is, it, it, it just, and also you should be able to cut go to a commercial break at, at, after any scene because it has left you curious about what's going to happen next. You've asked a question that needs to be answered. And if you can apply that to any scene, then the scene needs to be there. If you can't apply that, if there's no, no question, no moment, nothing revealed, it goes back to playwriting, you're either, it's either just for a, a good joke or to show character or give us a piece of key information. If it doesn't do that, then it's gone because it will be gone at some point. You're just wasting your time writing it. Yeah. Well, and also, uh, not just scenes, but characters. Don't fill your script with just a crap load of characters, because a lot of times when you're starting out, you write for your buddies, or you write for actors, you know, and, or whatever, and what you're going to do is you're going to end up losing a lot of the, those actors anyway, because those scenes are going to be cut. So everything should have a point. Um, so just minimize your characters, minimize locations. I mean, minimize, you know, just have it make sense. And that's a tough thing to do. I know I've done it. I think a lot of us have done it. You you have like ten characters when you could have had five. Um, so that's that's one thing I would say. Um, and 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 also going back to scenes making sense. Um, you got to think about the arc. You got to give, give make a roller coaster ride. Give twists and turns and, and and things like that. And be original. So each scene. Each scene is like a is like a postcard. You know, you should just stamp it, and send it out. It should be its own thing. It should be it it stand alone and make sense through the rest of the story. Yeah, here, you know, you're talking about that one sentence. That Goldman was famous for writing one long sentence, kind of then kind of chopping it up a little bit here and there. Yeah. But that works too. Is just sometimes you just write this one long sentence. It's just a, a almost a run on sentence. It's a stream of consciousness. You'd be surprised how far 
when I first wrote that first screenplay, I didn't know how to do it. That's how I did it. And then I went in and so oh, I guess that's an exterior and interior because I knew that much. And well, it's close. I did all the camera angles and yeah. you know everything because I didn't know any better. And I but you know I really learned a lot. And then later I, I learned more. But right. I don't pay any attention to three act structure at all unless I'm working for television. Because you've got commercials. Otherwise, when I write a, a, a novel, I don't pay attention to arc. I don't pay attention to three-act structure. I'm probably doing it internally yeah. because I've read so much. But I try to be careful with that because I'll tell you what happens with the three-act structure. You can feel that beat, and you know that this is fixing to happen next, especially television. I used to, especially. I could watch a television show, and I could watch 15 minutes, and I didn't have to watch the rest of it. I knew how, you know. Well, by the end of Act 1, it's all laid out. It's all and laid you out. Know you know what's going to happen. And you know the hero isn't going to die because right. he's got to be there next week. But but the oh, but that's the Game of Thrones. Well, that's just Game of Thrones. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. where is George? George spoiler yeah. yeah, but but you know the the thing is is that people get so caught up in three act structure and structure and art. I didn't even know there was such a thing. I never heard of that because I learned I taught myself. I didn't know how this stuff worked. So I just said, well, you know, I like a story that does this. Yeah. And that's the key, is finding a story that you want to tell and that you like and quit worrying about what three-act structure and all that stuff. Because if you find a story you like to tell, it'll generally always have one. You know, I, I mean, I always think of The Killers by Ernest Hemingway, the short story, it's not the movies. That short story itself is really almost like one act. But the second act, it has almost two acts if you count. The second act, you just visualize for yourself because when you get to the end of the story, you know what's going to happen. Right. But it's really almost just like one act. But and you could do that as a play, and you wouldn't you'd be a one act play. So not everything has to have three acts. And even a long novel, I, I'll digress. I'm noted for digressions, and you probably noticed that. But I, I do all these digressions and things. I let people talk. I let people go over here. I let I tell stories within stories. And that's for novels. With short stories, I mean, excuse me, in screenplays. You cannot do quite that liberally, but you can be, you'd be surprised. I think Tarantino did that, and I saw an interview with him recently. He said, I just decided to do it like the novels did it. Yeah. He said, I, I don't like screenplays like that because I know what's going to happen. But I, I said, in novels, I thought, wow, this is cool. Why don't somebody just do this? And I always have people, they say, well, I've got to change this to make this novel become a screenplay. Keeps, that's an exception because it was a short story. And what they end up doing is they end up sucking all the guts out of it and destroying what's there, trying to make, they just feel that they've got to do that. A lot of times a novel is laid out. All you have to do is follow it scene by scene, and then you can go back and constrict or change or do different things. You don't have to rape a piece to, so you can, can tell yourself that you're a screenwriter. And I, it's one of my pet peeves is seeing stuff where people said, how do I going to do this? Well, you just bought it because you like the book. <laughs> I had a, a recent thing not long ago where some people optioned a book of mine, and they called me up and said, well, what are we going to do? We're going to the book, and I want you to do a synopsis, and then we're going to do the synopsis, and then I want you to do a breakdown, and then we'll do the screenplay and for you to do the screenplay. I said, did you read the book? And they said, yeah. I said, there's your synopsis. <laughs> and I said, you either do it that way or I'm not interested. And, and they did, and I did the screenplay. But I thought it was stupid. You already read the book. What do I need to do a synopsis for? You know? yeah. I'm sorry I got wired, wired up. <laughs> <laughs> One thing on, on, on the, the three-act thing real fast is a, a good example of someone that went against the grain before Tarantino was Stanley Kubrick. He was doing two-act There's a lot of people that went against it. You know, and it's yeah. like if you look at 2001 or Full Metal Jacket, it's like here's half, of a, here's half and here's half, and it comes together. It's not one, two, three. It's really interesting how he did that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes, sir. No, uh, I just started to say, the way filmmaking is done now is somebody point out the difference between film now and film 30 years ago is films are underpopulated now. Mm -hmm. You've got the lead characters and you've got some extras doing stuff in the background and there's nobody in between. Whereas like in a Preston Sturgis movie in the 40s, People would come on for like two minutes, steal the damn movie, and walk out the door, and you'd never see them again, right? You know, and like that doesn't happen anymore because you know you have to pay somebody to come in and steal the movie and stuff like that. But like, uh, it's like the you know the way the way things are set up is there there's the leads and then there's and then there's extras, right? And that's about it. And and uh, in the old days, you could stop, like you said, and walk around and follow, follow a character for five minutes yeah. and then come back to the leads and stuff. But that doesn't happen anymore, right? And, and, and to me, what, what's happened with film is that f the camera itself has become such a character that it sometimes destroys the story. I do think that there's no set way to do a film. Sometimes the camera is important. But sometimes, as soon as I'm aware of the camera, I'm aware I'm watching a movie. And I'm, I want, I think there are times when you don't mind that. But generally... 
What you want is to be so caught up in the story. It's why John Sales is one of my favorite filmmakers. It's because he just kind of puts the camera there. Okay, guys, <laughs> go. And, you know, he's not a big camera mover. Then you had somebody like Roger Corman in his earlier movies, even some, the ones that he did that were actually pretty good. He moves the camera all the time. But he moves it in such a way that you feel like it's, you're seeing something, you're feeling the emotions going on, whether the, the camera, like... Rodriguez, a very great filmmaker, but I, I don't like his films for the simple reason that I just, I'm always aware of the camera, and it's about the camera. It's not about yeah. the story, and it's not about the characters. And Tarantino, I sometimes have the same trouble. So when, when stuff works for me, I don't want to know that I'm seeing a film. Now, that's my, my choice. Some people love the camera and the technical aspect of it so much that that's what they enjoy. I don't. And like I said, there are exceptions to everything, but try to tell a story. And even if you're the director or whatever, you don't have to be that fancy. Just tell the damn story and let the characters come alive. And, and, and trust, uh, get good actors and then trust them. You, I hear people say, I don't like actors. You know, I'm, well, man, I do, because otherwise your stuff sucks. You, you write it as well as you can, you get good actors, and you turn them loose. And, you, and you know, if you're the director, you've got to give them a little control, a little uh, check now and then. But I, I've seen people on sets where they would you know almost humiliate the actors I don't quite get what that's about and then you, if you hire the right people and you write the right script then the directing and everything else is just point the camera and get out of the way make sure that's lit well enough and, and get out of the focus. way and then focus it's, yeah that's right <laughs> then focus that's good yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh. Well, going back to what we were saying, um, in in terms of the three act structure, you know, I think that's why TV is becoming so relevant. Because, man, I'm I'm getting so tired of going to a movie and I can check my clock by the mm. beats. Everybody's saving the damn cat, and I know <laughs> what's going to happen before it happens. Right. And and it's it's really really frustrating. There's such a formula saving to the it. Cat. So so you know, uh, being able to explore and being able to. Uh, you know, explore stories and, and, and do what's right for the story, do what's right for the characters, explore characters, you know, characters, you know, there's a lot of ways to, you know, approach storytelling. So, uh, and, and, and I think one of the, one of the best things to do is just, you know, read, read, like Joe said earlier, read screenplays because um, I'm always amazed when I read screenplays, the, the, the best, you know, the best ones, because they're actually compelling reads, you know, these guys, you know, they're able to, a lot of the a lot of the guys that are really good at it can do really good prose with really short action lines and 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 you know read and see how they're doing that and some of them are, you know and see that some people not everybody does it the same but you get a lot of ideas and a lot of you know a lot of inspiration through that so uh, the original thing that um, Herbert was talking about was you know you don't want to have any unimportant scenes you don't want to put something in it just because you think something is funny or you think this one scene would be kind of amusing but there's not really a good spot for it but you think you can kind of wedge it in here it's not important for the story it's not it's no reason to do it and that's exactly what i was talking about earlier where dad and i would go back and forth about a scene and then we'd get a little bit further down the line we realized that this is so over explained it's it's it actually will explain itself and you know naturally down the line so you go back and you cut that and that whole like just trying to make sure that when somebody's reading it, they're not going to get bored halfway through getting through the thing that if you had just waited, it would have explained itself anyways. So yeah, just to highlight the initial thing, which I think we got very far away from, and I'd already come up with an answer, and then <laughs> I kind of zoned out. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Well, you you know the thing with the my the screenplay Keith and I are doing, we don't even know what the plot is. You know, yeah, we just go in every day and figure and it like, out. Shit, don't ask me that. Yeah, <laughs> we just go in and try to figure it out. And, and sometimes we'll just be laughing. Oh, that's the funniest thing. Okay, we got to cut that. But we enjoyed it. But the thing is, is that I've always found, what, I mostly have done adaptations of my own work. But when I write something original, I have no idea what's going to happen. I don't plot it out. Because the screenplay itself is the outline in a sense. But don't let anybody ever tell you that it's just a blueprint. It, it matters how it's written. It matters how it sounds. That's why when you read William Goldman or you read Robert Town, you go, wow. Or some of the, the was it Leonard, Leonard Schrader? Or no, no, Paul Schrader. Paul Schrader. Uh, yeah, his brother's Leonard. Uh, uh, Paul Schrader would write, like Taxi Driver. You read those scripts, they're great. Uh, Walter Hill's early scripts, those revolutionized the way scripts were written for a long time because he would just have these one short sentences. And then when Goldman writes scripts, you thought, He's never read a screenplay at all. He has no clue. But this is riveting. I cannot put it down. You know? 
uh, Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid is my favorite screenplay of all time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're almost out of time. Is there any um, further tips or anything else you want to say about screenwriting before we call it? A, a you can game? buy our books back here. We'll teach you so much. <laughs> <laughs> they are. The secrets of the age. Uh, or is just questions. donating cash to me will we'll help your writing. I, I think we have time probably for one question or two questions. There, there, there was that hand came up first, so. Uh, for him, it, for me? Oh, you yeah. said you wrote the script for Son of Batman. I did. Are you writing the script for the sequel coming up, Batman vs. Robin? No, son, I wish I was, but I'm not. <laughs> and and uh, what, the way it works in, in uh, animation a lot of times, they had a comic book already was called Batman and Son, and they wanted to do an adaptation. But they had some certain things that they wanted there. They, it, it's, in this one, it's kind of like work for hire, but in that way, I don't just you know throw a sack over its head. I mean to do it as well as I can. And, uh, <laughs> but you know what, what it is is that you're actually adapting a kind of synopsis they have, and that's the one I, I did, and I really enjoyed it. But I want to see that one, too. I don't know who's doing it, but uh, I'm looking forward David to it. David Goyer started it. David Goyer? Yeah, but then somebody else. Oh, so. took, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is there another question? Did we just stun you all? Well, yeah. I, I, I'm we sure, just answered everything. I'm sure they're, they're happy to answer some questions. I'm surprised you didn't start out by talking about outlines, because I did hear about the script starting with an outline. I've written... I've had more outlines than anybody in this room, probably by a factor. Um, they're almost useless. I mean, they're, they're, sometimes it's a good thing to do if, you, if you're if you having trouble just kind of getting a sense of your story. But really, outlines exist. They're sales tools or they're production tools. They're usually things that are done on television to, uh, uh, since you're always pressed for time, a script may not be done in time. An outline is a document you can give to a studio, a network, or a actual production that says these are roughly the scenes that are going to occur in this in this order in this location with these people sort of doing this stuff so i know to get cavalry for this scene and you know the indian camp over here and the tyrannosaurus in act three i'm I mean, going to see that movie already yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know the the thing about those outlines too is if you're doing independent films you don't have to bother with that you just get the script done yeah. and and for me i never did the outlines I, I think i did two and i think i'm just dreadful at outlines yeah. because i never know what's going to happen until i'm writing it and then if i if i outline something i feel like i've written it and i'm no longer interested in doing it i've actually done that a couple of times and once i had the outline when i was certain i thought i don't want to write this i've already outlined it i've lost interest in because I, I know what's going to happen, so I've lost the magic. So I, I, for me, I always just say, you know, like the guys that came with me, I said, did you read the book? Yeah, there's your outline. You know? You I, start at the beginning? I, I hope so. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know where to how you can, you can do something backwards, memento, you know, or you can, but, but. Uh, I have no idea. Well, something like that, I, you might have to sit down and have a chart, you know, to keep up with what's yeah. going on. But, you know, all I'm saying is that I, outlines kill something for me. And the only way I would write them is if a studio says, we're paying you a whole lot of money and we have to see an outline. I'll tell you a true story, and I can't say who because I'd get us in trouble. But a friend of mine had a project with a producer, and they wanted to see an outline. He did an outline, and I think it was 12 pages or something like that. So they turned it in to the, to the producer's assistant. He looks at it and says, look, he ain't got a whole lot of time to read. And this is 12 pages. I want it cut to six. He said, fine. He cut it to six. He took it to him. He said, you know what? Can you cut this to three? He cut it to three. And then later, this is, this is true. This, you think I'm making this in Hollywood. You don't make this up. This is real. Am I laughing? And then he, no, you're not laughing. You see, any, you see any humor over here? And then he came, not finished, not finished, not finished. He says, now we're going to cut it down to a page. And he did. This is over a series of months. And then they finally said, well, you know, if we had just a really tight paragraph. And so he worked and sweated in the paragraph. And then when he came in with it, he said, you know, he's really busy. Can you just go in and tell him what your idea is? And then they didn't do it anyway. Yeah. No, I'd have been out of that operation a long time. Oh, yeah. I like, to do, I like to do a beat sheet. I kind of do yeah. a, I like to do a, a really informal outline that's for me, you know. Uh, I'm not present. I'm, I want to present someone with a script, and generally, I'm not presenting, you know, ideas, but uh, that are, that that haven't been fleshed out to that point. But I do like to do like a really informal outline of events. Pr oftentimes, because as I'm as they come to me, I'm just kind of, you know, 
uh, jotting them down and getting them on paper so that you know I have them for later. So I just kind of that becomes an assembly that I'll loosely refer to as I'm you know as I'm writing. But it depends yeah. on the nature of your piece. You know, yep. What are you doing? If you're doing something that's kind of heavily plotted, a mystery, having a set of steps that you're clear on is probably a good idea. But I mean, and, and any tool that works for you as a writer is. Fine. There, there's no yeah. If you want to make out, if you want to make outlines, yeah. make outlines. But, I'm, I'm not against them. I'm just saying, yeah. you know, I don't use them. But I think whatever you works for you. Yeah. Raymond yeah. Chandler had the great, the great novel, The Big Sleep. They adapted it, yeah. and they were getting through it. And this thing is, is like one of the most famous mystery crime novels ever written. And they were doing the script, and they got to the point and said, "Well, who killed the chauffeur?" Right. Yeah. And they didn't know, so they called Raymond Chandler and said, "Who killed the chauffeur?" He said, "Hell, I don't know." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't. Yeah. <laughs> well, with that note, I think uh, we were. Sadly, we're out of time. Um, I want to thank you all for coming to this uh, session here, and I thank, of course, the panel that, that's been here, and thank you for coming out, and hope you enjoy the rest of the Nacogdoches Film Fest today. And for all of those that have money and want to buy the books, we're right here. Yes, there's some books from Joe and Mike. Yeah, books. Books. Fantastic. <laughs>